Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I am continuing to teach on financial stewardship. This is the end of my second week. I wrote this book about it. It's a 166-page book, and we're asking for a donation of some amount, just some contribution. We'll give away it probably a minimum of 50,000, 70,000 of these. And so we ask for something, but if you could not or would not give anything for the whole book. I've got this little booklet entitled Financial Stewardship that I wrote, and we'll just give that to you as a free gift. And then we also have CDs, DVDs, a study guide, and even some testimonies that are on video that would be a real blessing to you. I played a video yesterday, a testimony of Ruth Levi, who it's just miraculous what God has done with her and her husband, and even her salvation was, was great. If you haven't seen that, you can go to our website, awmi.net, and look under video testimonies, and uh, we have her testimony on there where an angel appeared unto her and gave her directions to come to our school. Man, that really blessed me to think that God would have an angel tell somebody to come to our school, and she's just been transformed. And we have a lot of other testimonies. This will work for anybody. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, that God is no respecter of persons. Sometimes when you hear people talk about how they've been blessed financially and how God has provided for them, you just think, well, that's them, and this is me, and things don't work for me. Well, if that's what you believe, they won't work for you. But if you would believe that God is no respecter of persons and that if He's done something for me or anybody else, the same thing would work for you. If you would believe that, you can begin to start seeing God's prosperity in your life. And I've already used a lot of scriptures. There's no way that I can go back through everything that I've talked about. I want to turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and start using some verses out of chapter 8 and chapter 9. Let me just make this introductory statement that 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 are the most scriptures in the entire Bible in one spot on finances. Every verse in chapter 8 and chapter 9 is all talking about money. Now, that's amazing. You know, the Lord used parables about money, about people who received talents and different things like this. And there's, there's a lot said about money in many, many different places. But this is the most information about money, about finances or stewardship of any place that I'm aware of in the Bible. And so you need to become familiar with 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. In chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, that's just old English, for we want you to know of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And there's going to be about three or four times in these next two chapters that grace is linked to giving. And that's a strong statement. Grace isn't only getting things on an unearned, undeserved basis, but grace is everything that God is, everything that God has available to you on an unearned, undeserved basis. So it's not just talking about that you didn't earn it, but it's talking about everything that God is is available to you on the basis of grace. And so it says that he wanted us to be aware of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Boy, there's a number of things in that second verse that most people just never combine. For instance, they talk about a great trial of affliction and the abundance of their joy. Did you know people that haven't tapped into the Lord, if they're just doing things in their own strength and in the natural, joy and affliction don't go together. But once you tap into the Lord and once you start walking with Him, He gives you a peace that passes understanding. And I can testify that in my life, I've had terrible things happen to me. I've had tragedies happen in my life, and yet there was just an abundance of joy. Some of you think uh, that doesn't even fit. It doesn't in the natural, but it does with God. The Scripture says in Psalms chapter 16, verse 11, "...in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy. At His right hand are pleasures forevermore." It's not based on circumstances. If you really have the relationship with God that has been made available to you through Jesus, you can have joy in the midst of affliction. 
And then it goes on to say in the same verse, and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. Again, most people see don't put poverty and liberality, giving together. Most people think, well, I would give, but I just don't have anything. And if they are in poverty, well, then they think that that automatically excludes them from giving. These people had deep poverty, and yet they became givers, and they started giving. I tell you, you can give. I don't care what your situation is. I actually knew a person who got born again in prison, and in prison he got hold of this teaching about God wanting him to prosper. And so, you know what he did? He started taking the bar of soap that was given to him, and he cut it in half. And he gave a bar of soap away to somebody. And he started taking some of his rations and some of the things that he was getting, and he started giving off of those things. And did you know, it wasn't very long until he had a footlocker, and he had all of these things in prison. And he had all of this stuff, and he was just a sinner for people to come. I mean, it'll work in prison. It'll work in a third world country. And this is another criticism that I've heard against prosperity. People will say, well, that's only an American gospel. It won't work other places. I've seen it work all around the world. I've got friends in Uganda, and this uh, Pastor Herbert, uh, he's a good friend of mine. He was actually born on the exact day that my wife and I got married. So I can always remember his birthday, October the 27th, 1972. And anyway, he's been through a lot of things. His parents were killed, and uh, he went through the Idi Amin days. And he was pastoring a church of about 4,000 people, and it was extreme poverty. And yet, we have started sowing into his life. He's got hold of these truths. He now has a bank, and he is loaning money out to people in his congregation and even people outside of the congregation. And I mean, they are prospering, and they have become a center of, of blessing other people. It works in Uganda. It'll work any place in the world. I've been out to uh, the Karamoja region, and I ministered to people out there, and some of those people, they don't even wear clothes. We went out there, and they had to give the women something to cover themselves with when I went out there, but typically they don't wear clothes. I mean, it was remote. And yet we begin to start sharing the word with them, and they are prosperous now. One of them, um, anyway, I could just go on and give you testimony, but they now have bought a motorcycle. They are traveling to other villages and doing things. And it may be relative to where you are, but the, the gospel will work anywhere, and you can prosper regardless of where you are. And so these people had deep poverty, and yet they were able to give. And it says in verse 3, to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. In other words, they wanted to give even more. They just didn't have anything else to give. It goes on to say right here that God accepts it according to what we have, not according to what we don't have. I don't think you ever ought to go in debt to give to the ministry or to give to your church or to do something like that. God only wants you to be faithful over what you have, to be a steward over what you have. And they even went, they wanted to give more than what they had. It says in verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Man, that's awesome. You know what? They actually entreated him with much entreaty. That means that they pressed him, please let us be a part of giving to these other people and ministering to their needs. There's been a few times in my life that I've had people do this. I remember one time we were building a building down in Colorado Springs, and, and it was just a shell, but we set up tables, and we had our partners come there and served them a meal, and I shared with them about things, and then we were dismissing them, and I had some of the partners say, well, aren't you going to receive an offering? And I said, well, you already are partners you give. I said, no, I was just sharing with you what's happening, wanted you to see this facility, and they said, we want to give. And they begin to say, you need to let us give. And man, that was awesome to have people ask you to receive an offering. That doesn't happen too many times, but that's what they did. They actually entreated, much entreaty on the Apostle Paul to receive the money so that they could send it to the people in Jerusalem. And in verse 5, and it says, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. And this, is, this summarizes a lot of what I've been saying over the last two weeks, that it's really not about your gift. It's about your heart 
GOD IS AFTER YOUR HEART, NOT YOUR MONEY. BUT GETTING YOUR MONEY IS ONE WAY TO GET TO YOUR HEART. AS JESUS SAID, WHERE YOUR TREASURE IS, THERE WILL YOUR HEART BE ALSO. SO YOU CAN ACTUALLY DIRECT YOUR HEART TOWARDS GOD BY SOWING INTO THE MINISTRY AND GIVING. AND WHEN YOU DO THAT, IT RELEASES YOUR HEART AND PUTS YOUR HEART INTO THE THINGS OF GOD. AND THIS IS WHAT HE SAID, THAT THIS IS NOT ONLY WHAT HE WANTED THE CORINTHIANS TO DO, BUT IT SAYS IN VERSE 6, INASMUCH AS WE DESIRED TITUS THAT AS HE HAD BEGUN, SO HE WOULD ALSO FINISH IN YOU THIS SAME GRACE ALSO. IN OTHER WORDS, PAUL WANTED EVERYBODY TO HAVE THIS SAME ATTITUDE CONCERNING GIVING. IN VERSE 7, IT SAYS, THEREFORE, AS YOU ABOUND IN EVERYTHING, IN FAITH, IN UTTERANCE, AND KNOWLEDGE, AND IN ALL DILIGENCE, AND IN YOUR LOVE TO US, SEE THAT YOU ABOUND IN THIS GRACE ALSO. THIS IS THE THIRD TIME IN SEVEN VERSES THAT THE WORD GRACE HAS BEEN TIED TO PROSPERITY. IN OTHER WORDS, YOU CAN'T EARN IT. IT'S NOT LIKE WHEN YOU GIVE, YOU ARE BUYING GOD'S FAVOR. THAT WOULDN'T BE GRACE. BUT WHEN YOU GIVE, IT IS FAITH, AND THAT RELEASES THE GRACE THAT GOD HAS ALREADY GIVEN TOWARDS US. IN VERSE 8, IT SAYS, I SPEAK NOT BY COMMANDMENT, BUT BY OCCASION AND FORWARDNESS OF OTHERS, AND TO PROVE THE SINCERITY OF YOUR LOVE. DID YOU KNOW THIS REALLY DOES PROVE WHERE YOUR HEART IS AT, YOUR GIVING. I HAVE PEOPLE COME ALL OF THE TIME AND SAY, MAN, I'M WITH YOU. I JUST LOVE YOUR MINISTRY, AND YOU CAN COUNT ON ME. AND I VERY SELDOM DO THIS, BUT SOMETIMES I'VE HAD QUESTIONS ABOUT, IS THIS PERSON TRYING TO CON ME? ARE THEY TRYING TO GET SOMETHING FROM ME? AND YOU KNOW, ONE OF THE THINGS I'LL DO, I'LL GO LOOK UP THEIR GIVING TO THE MINISTRY. AND THERE'S OFTEN THAT MANY OF THESE PEOPLE WHO SAY, OH, I'M WITH YOU AND I BELIEVE 100%, THEY HAVE GIVEN ZERO. NOW, I, THAT DOESN'T MAKE ME NOT LOVE THEM. IT DOESN'T MAKE ME REJECT THEM. I'M GOING TO STILL MINISTER THE WORD OF GOD. BUT IT SHOWS ME THAT THEIR HEART ISN'T WITH ME. IF THEIR HEART WAS WITH ME, THEIR, their uh, TREASURE WOULD BE THERE. WHERE YOUR TREASURE IS, THERE WILL YOUR HEART BE ALSO. AND IF YOU DON'T INVEST MONEY IN SOMETHING, THEN YOU DON'T REALLY BELIEVE IN IT. AGAIN, THERE'S PEOPLE THAT WILL CRITICIZE THAT AND THINK, BOY, YOU'RE SAYING THIS TO MANIPULATE PEOPLE. I'M SAYING RIGHT HERE WHAT THESE SCRIPTURES ARE SAYING. THIS PROVES THE SINCERITY OF YOUR LOVE WHEN YOU START BECOMING FAITHFUL IN YOUR GIVING. IF YOU AREN'T FAITHFUL IN YOUR GIVING, YOUR LOVE IS NOT SINCERE. I'M NOT SAYING THAT THERE ISN'T LOVE. I'M NOT SAYING THAT YOU'RE TOTALLY WRONG, BUT I'M SAYING YOUR LOVE ISN'T COMPLETE. IT'S NOT PERFECT. AND HE GOES ON TO SAY IN THE NEXT VERSE, IN VERSE 9, FOR YOU KNOW THE GRACE. HERE'S THE FOURTH TIME IN JUST NINE VERSES THAT THE WORD GRACE IS USED IN ASSOCIATION WITH MONEY. YOU KNOW THE GRACE OF OUR LORD JESUS CHRIST, THAT THOUGH HE WAS RICH, YET FOR YOUR SAKES HE BECAME POOR, THAT YOU THROUGH HIS POVERTY MIGHT BE RICH. THIS DIDN'T SAY THAT YOU THROUGH HIS POVERTY MIGHT BE ABLE TO JUST BARELY GET BY AND HAVE ENOUGH TO, YOU KNOW, TO SURVIVE BUT NOT THRIVE. NO, THIS SAYS THAT JESUS DIED SO THAT THROUGH HIS POVERTY YOU MIGHT BE RICH. AND th THE OBVIOUS MEANING OF THIS IS IT'S TALKING ABOUT MONEY. AGAIN, I SAY THAT IF YOU TAKE THIS IN ITS CONTEXT, IF YOU TAKE THE TEXT AWAY FROM THE CONTEXT, THEN ALL YOU GOT LEFT IS A CON. IF YOU TAKE THIS IN ITS CONTEXT, EVERY VERSE IN CHAPTER 8 AND IN CHAPTER 9 IS TALKING ABOUT MONEY. THERE'S 24 VERSES IN CHAPTER 8. THERE'S 15 VERSES IN CHAPTER 9. SO THAT'S A TOTAL OF 39 VERSES. EVERY SINGLE ONE OF THEM IS TALKING ABOUT MONEY. AND FOR YOU TO TAKE THAT THIS... WELL, THIS DOESN'T MEAN THAT JESUS DIED SO THAT YOU COULD BECOME RICH FINANCIALLY. THIS IS TALKING ABOUT SO THAT YOU COULD BE RICH IN YOUR EMOTIONS, IN YOUR RELATIONSHIPS, IN YOUR JOY, IN YOUR PEACE. WELL, I BELIEVE IT INCLUDES THOSE THINGS, BUT AGAIN, TAKE IT IN CONTEXT. EVERY SINGLE VERSE BEFORE AND AFTER IS TALKING ABOUT MONEY, AND YOU ARE BEING DISHONEST WITH SCRIPTURE IF YOU DON'T THINK THAT THIS IS SAYING THAT JESUS BECAME POOR FOR YOUR SAKE SO THAT YOU, THROUGH HIS POVERTY, MIGHT BE MADE RICH TALKING ABOUT MONEY. THIS IS PART OF YOUR INHERITANCE. DID YOU KNOW ONE OF THE MISTAKES THAT THE MODERN CHURCH HAS MADE, THEY'VE TAKEN SALVATION AND THEY APPLY THAT ONLY TO FORGIVENESS OF SINS. THEY SAY THAT'S THE ONLY THING THAT IS DONE FOR EVERYONE AND IT'S AVAILABLE TO EVERY SINGLE PERSON. BUT THE WORD SOZO THAT IS TRANSLATED SAVED OR SAVED 
Uh, you know, I, I've heard over 365 times in the New Testament, one for every day of the year. That word that is translated so many times as saved or salvation, it refers to healing. Like over in James chapter 5, where it says, If anybody's sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil and pray over him. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Sozo the sick. It's obvious that this isn't talking about that it will forgive your sins. It's talking about that it'll heal your body. So the word salvation, as used in the Bible, isn't limited to just forgiveness of sins. It's referring to the healing of your body. It's referring to the salvation of your soul, your mental, emotional part. And it's also referring to prosperity, like right here. Jesus died to give you financial riches. That is a part of what He purchased. It's available to you. Man, that's awesome. And some people have just said that, well, you know, Jesus was poor and Jesus didn't have anywhere to lay His head. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay His head. Jesus did say that, but it wasn't because He didn't have money. He had a treasurer that went around and He gave away money all of the time. At the Last Supper, when Judas got up and left, the rest of the disciples thought he was going out to give money to somebody late at night. It wasn't an unusual thing. Most of you don't have a treasurer that follows you around and manages your money. You can manage it on your own. For Jesus to have a treasurer, he had to have money. When he was born, the gold and frankincense and myrrh was a, was a fortune. God didn't ask somebody else to bring his son into the earth and then make them pay for his upkeep. God paid for it. He had these kings bring all of this gold and Jesus had money. He wasn't poor in that sense, but he became poor just like he became sin. Jesus wasn't a sinner the whole time he was on the earth. He lived a sinless life, but on the cross, he took our sin into his own body on the tree. And likewise, he took poverty. He became poor on the cross. And he bore poverty, not his whole time here on the earth, but during that crucifixion, he became poor so that you and I might be made rich. It's a part of your inheritance. It's a part of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when religious people come along and start telling you that, no, God doesn't want you to have a lot. He wants you to just barely get by. It says that He will supply your need, not your wants. Well, I will agree this, that God isn't going to empower you to just lust for all kinds of stuff. He's not into satisfying your lust, but this doesn't mean that He'll just barely get you by. God wants you to prosper. I've said this numerous times, but God is El Shaddai, which means more than enough, not El Chipo. <laughs> you know, the word El Shaddai is used in the Bible, this is over in uh, the book of Genesis and stuff. It means the many-breasted one, talking about how that a mother supplies the milk, the nourishment for her child. And the word El Shaddai literally means many-breasted one. It talks about that there is more than enough. There's never a shortage. God is into abundance. When Jesus blessed the five loaves and two fish, He didn't just give everybody a tiny bit so that they wouldn't starve. He actually started with five loaves, two fish, and when he got through feeding the multitude, 5,000 men, not including all the women and children, he took up the fragments and there was 12 baskets full of fragments left. He had more left over than what he started with. That's an abundance. When he multiplied the wine in John chapter 2 at the wedding, he multiplied it, and I figured this out. I'd have to look at my commentary right now to see this, but he, he made like 160-something gallons of wine, and it was the best wine. He didn't supply them just enough to barely get them through. He gave them a super abundance. It says in John chapter 10, verse 10, it's the thief, that's the devil talks about, that came to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I am come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. And of course, that's talking about joy and peace and victory and all kinds of things. But according to this verse, it also includes finances. If you aren't prospering, it's not God's fault. God has provided it. But there's things that will hinder it, which a lot of it is religious teaching that somehow or another God wants you to be poor, that He's 
He's debasing you. He's humbling you. He's uh, knocking you flat of your face. He's, he's the one that's causing your problems because somehow or another you've displeased Him. That's not true. It says, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means it's not based on your performance. That He became poor so that you through His poverty might be made rich. You know, there was a situation when I first got in ministry that we were given an eviction notice. Man, I had a miracle happen and we stayed, but we were just struggling because I didn't understand the things that I'm telling you. And we literally went a week without any food. And Jamie, we had, I think, 75 cents, three quarters, and Jamie actually took some laundry, put it in our car, and drove over to the laundromat in our apartment complex to wash clothes. And we didn't have enough gas to hardly go anywhere, and that 75 cents was everything. We hadn't eaten in a week. And while she was gone, I got to praying, and, I, and it was my fault that we were in this. I didn't understand that just because I was in the ministry didn't mean that I couldn't work. I had to be ministering to enough people to meet the needs, and I wasn't ministering to many people. I shouldn't have been expecting the ministry to pay my way, but anyway, it was my fault, but Jamie and I had been like a week without any food, and I was feeling terrible, and I was, not for my sake, but for Jamie. I was saying, God, I'm supposed to be providing for her, and I was just crying out to God while she was gone and praying and saying, God, I'd give my right arm to feed Jamie, to take care of Jamie, and you aren't taking care of us. And boy, the Lord spoke back to me in love, but it was a rebuke out of Luke chapter 12 that says, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I mean, God spoke that to me so forcefully, I knew that it wasn't His fault. Whatever the problem was, was on our part. So I repented and I said, God, I'm sorry. And when Jamie got back from washing clothes, I said, I don't know how or when, but before this day's over, we're going to eat food. And so we didn't have anything for lunch, didn't have anything for supper. We went to church that night, and a guy who lived in that apartment complex asked if I'd come over. It's a long story, but anyway, we got over to his house about 10 o'clock, and he gave me a whole bunch of fish, and apparently he knew that our reaction showed we must have been hungry, so he gave me potatoes, and he gave us peas and everything, and we rushed back to our apartment, and Jamie cooked it up, and right before midnight, we ate food that day, and it all happened because I began to recognize that this wasn't God that was holding out on us. It was God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And this is the point I'm trying to get across to you, that God became poor. Jesus became poor so that you through His poverty might be made rich. It is God's will to supply your needs. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material, and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.